Okay. So welcome guys to uh, the CPS talk today. Um, I'd like to introduce our speaker for the day. So this is Dr. Kelly Robinson. She's interested in how behavior, physiological systems and energetics interact to impact on individual fitness and survival in wildlife populations. She investigates how hormones and neuropeptides influence behavioral expression and energetics from a whole, whole organism to a cellular level. Uh, much of her research is focused on oxytocin and its role in maternal and social behavior, and she has expanded into the effects of persistent organic pollutants on physiology. Uh, she has also studied marine mammal species, principally the grey seal, for much of her career to date, and is expanding her research to include terrestrial animal species and humans. Uh, Kelly completed her PhD at the University of St Andrews in 2014 and did a three-year postdoc at the Scottish Oceans Institute before taking one year of maternity leave. She is currently an associate lecturer at St Andrews who teaches in animal behaviour, physiology and evolution. Uh, um, Kelly, to talk. Thank you very much, Rosa. Okay. It says someone's waiting in the... It, it says I'm in the waiting room. That's a bit weird. Um, should I admit you? <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, thanks very much, guys, for coming along to hear my talk about lab work gone wild. So hopefully, as the title suggests, we're going to be talking all about how you can take the various things that you do in the lab and apply them to situations that you might not usually think are, you know, sort of appropriate environments to, to, to take these techniques into. Um, yeah, when we say lab work, I'm sure you will have various images in your mind of benches and lab coats and gloves and all sorts of all sorts of things that are usually indoors and usually in a bit more of a controlled environment as the picture before you is hopefully sort of conjuring. This is the Isle of May, a wonderful island off the east coast of Scotland, where I have been taking my lab work into the world for the last 10 years, essentially. And when I was looking over my slides, I kind of realized that it's not just about taking the lab work into the wild. It's also about taking lots of techniques and theories and approaches and inventions from other fields outside of biology. So obviously I principally am a biologist, but in this talk you'll see that I have borrowed and taken inspiration from and adapted all sorts of technology and theories from fields of uh, including things like psychology, chemistry, physics, engineering, all sorts of things going out to this island to help me and my collaborators do our science. So hopefully there'll be a little bit of something in there for everyone. And yeah, so this is our this is our island, the Isle of May. Uh, it's quite, quite rugged. We go there in the winter, so it's usually pretty harsh conditions, but it's a fantastic place to study all sorts of types of seagoing creatures. In the summer, it's a good place to study seabirds, but in the winter, we go there to study the seals. And on the ground, this is what it looks like. This is early in the season, and you can see a few of our seals are just starting to arrive because this is the place where they have their pups every year. This is the year they come once a year, the mothers give birth and they raise their pups for two to three weeks. Then they wean them abruptly. They never see them again, essentially. The pups are left to fend for themselves. The moms go back out to sea and the pups eventually go out to sea too. So lots of these guys rolling around, getting into mischief as far as the pups are concerned. They should stay by their mothers and behave themselves, but they often don't. They go wandering around getting into trouble and the mothers tend to protect them, feed them, nurture them. But as I said, once we get to about the three week mark, the mother goes back to sea and the pup is left to fend for itself. So this is what it looks like a bit later on in the season. As you can see, it's quite mucky and muddy and uh, it's, it's pretty typical of conditions essentially. So you can imagine trying to do anything clean or you know, anything that requires sort of delicate handling might be a bit tricky in this sort of environment. Um, but what you can also see in this photo are the buildings. So this white building up here, that is where our lab is on this field site. So this is where we do all of our work uh, collecting samples and data. And then this is where we go to actually do any precise lab work that we can do on this island. Now, this island has been uh, home to scientists studying seals for literally decades, and it's been a fantastic place to take behavioral observations, collect lots of data about behavior, to get samples that we can bring back to mainland that we can actually analyze back in more traditional labs and then measure all sorts of things from hormones to pollutant levels in these animals. Um, but 
We've also started branching out into doing experimental work actually on the island. Rather than taking this data and all these samples back to the mainland purely, we started actually doing all sorts of experimental work actually while we're on the island. And today I'm going to be talking about two case studies that I've been involved with where we've done this. First, it, we're going to go quickly go through one of the studies that um, I designed, looking at oxytocin dynamics in these seals. And then the second case study is going to be looking at the experimental approach that me and my collaborators designed to work on studying pollutants while we're on the island. So first of all, we're going to talk about oxytocin. So hopefully, I'm hoping that you guys have heard of this hormone. Um, it tends to get a lot of uh, attention in the popular press, in magazines, things like that. People call it the love hormone. It certainly has connections to uh, uh, affiliative and social behaviors, but that's not all it does. So if you've heard of it referred to as the love hormone. That there is more to it than that. So essentially, it's basically crucial for maternal behavior and physiology. It's involved in the physical process of giving birth and then also with bonding and correctly behaving towards your infant. There are other hormones involved, of course, but it's a key one involved in this process. But it is also involved in social bonding outside of the maternal offspring bonds between unrelated individuals. It's hypothesized to act in a positive feedback loop across all the individuals involved in these bonds. And there's a lot of good evidence supporting this now. So I say hypothesized, but it's pretty, we're pretty sure this is what's going on. So if you're interacting with someone or something that you'll share a positive bond with, it can be your pet dog, it can be someone in your family, it can be one of your friends, then you're receiving stimuli from them. It's triggering oxytocin release, which is then stimulating you to stay close to them and continue interacting with them. So you then get more oxytocin release and round and round we go in a big circle. However, even though it's been well studied in some aspects, the consequences of variation in oxytocin, especially in infants, is relatively poorly understood to date. And its dynamics in natural systems, especially in wildlife species, are essentially unexplored. It's getting better now, but when I started doing this work, there were very, very few under 10 studies that actually looked at this in wild animals. And it's for good reason. It's a very hard substance to study. It's a neuropeptide hormone. It's released by the brain into circulation, has a very rapid clearance rate, so it can be very tricky to work with. But you can also do some great science with it. So why are we doing this in gray seals, a marine mammal, which certainly does not on the face of it appear to lend itself to studying neuropeptide hormones? Well, as I've mentioned already, these guys have a very short dependent period. They are only with their pups for that 18 day window, which means that we can actually go and observe every single thing that's happening to these guys. We can literally go there, sit in the hide and document everything that's happening. It's not often possible to do that with other species that have a much longer time with the mothers or with their infants. The mothers are also individually recognizable. You can see this mother is sporting some lovely spotty patches on her coat, and these are stable for her entire life. So we can use them to identify her year after year after year. And blood samples can also be safely collected from both the mothers and the pups. They are actually sufficiently large enough that that is not of concern for them. So that is a real strength for the system. And another really good thing for us is that mothers look fast during lactation and they're the only providers for their pup. The, the males that fertilize the egg to make the pup are not involved at all in looking after it. So she is the sole provider and she's fasting. So we can literally measure how much weight she loses across the breeding season and get a good handle on what she's in, investing energetically into that pup and know that it's purely down to her. So that really lends itself to the energetic side of studying these animals. So when I was thinking about, well, we did a whole bunch of work on these guys, and we actually were able to detect some really interesting natural correlations between hormones and behaviors. So we had a really good relationship between how much time our seals spent cuddled up together in close proximity to each other and the maternal oxytocin levels. So the higher the oxytocin, the more time she spent close to her pup. Brilliant. That's exactly what you want, because if you spend time away from your pup, the likelihood you're going to get separated increases, and then it's very likely that the pup will starve to death and, and, and or may have some other mishap, might get injured, might be attacked by seagulls, other ways that it can essentially be predated on and, and end up dead. So I sat in my hide, I collected lots of behavioral data, and we went down and collected some blood samples, and we were able to find this really nice correlation. But as I'm sure you guys are all aware, correlation does not equal causation. So that was the big problem with this study. This is all very nice, this is all very interesting, 
But to really be able to say that oxytocin is causing that behavior, we'd have to do some sort of experiment. And this is where we go to our taking the lab to the field, needing to prove causation. So in the lab, which up to this point is where the vast majority of oxytocin work had been done, this would be easy because you would be working with rodents. And this is the sort of thing you would get. So this is the fateful figure that I saw in this paper down at the bottom of the slide that I was looking at when I was a PhD student. And this is the, some classic social recognition experiments you can do with rodents in the lab. And I looked at this one and I thought, we could probably do that with seals. And I went to the leader of the field team at the time and I said, what do you think? Could, could we do this with seals? And we talked about it for a, a whole afternoon, basically. And ultimately, we said, yes. We might need to adapt this, this protocol because seals are obviously not mice and they're a lot bigger and a lot more challenges to consistently have the same individuals and expose them to each other. But yes, why not? Let's give it a go. So we designed this experiment. We adapted the methodology somewhat, but this is what we came up with. So when the seals wean from their mothers, when these pups wean from their mothers, they have this really long post weaning fast, where they don't actually go to sea, they just stay on land and have this time where they are not feeding, they're just resting. And there's a few different theories about why they do this. It might be to convert all this massive blubber that they put on while they've been drinking their milk into muscles so they can actually swim. Some people say that it's because they're so fat, they're actually too buoyant to be able to swim successfully. I'm not too sure about that one personally, but they definitely do just hang out on the colony for weeks after they have weaned. And we can take advantage of that by rounding some up and building them little seal hotels. So we can make them nice and comfy and make sure that they're very happy and keep them in these pens so they don't interact across the pens. That generates two pools of seals, a bunch that have interacted with each other previously and two sets that have never previously interacted with each other. And then we can essentially do what we did with our, what this rodent study is saying, where we can then do trials where we're observing the behavior. What happens if you stick seals together that have lived together previously? And what happens if you stick seals together that have never met each other previously? And that's how we tested for social recognition in these animals. And this is what our little seal hotels look like. So we went to great effort to make them some beautiful swimming pools, which they absolutely adored to the point that we had seals trying to break into our seal hotels, trying to get into these pools. Um, because they can actually get out. Um, they didn't, but these fences are not robust enough to withstand a determined seal pup or a determined adult. So yeah, they were very happy in there. And it meant that we could borrow them for a short period of time and put them together, film the results and decode the videos. And what happened was we did find evidence that the gray seals were able to recognize their conspecifics. We used exactly the same metrics that we used in the rodent studies. We looked at the number of aggressive interactions, the number of investigative behaviors, and we found that they were recognizing each other and reducing their aggression to each other. Fantastic. But we wanted to go that one more step and actually look at the oxytocin dynamics here. So this is what we came up with. We adapted our methodology again. And instead of just pairing individuals and seeing what happened, we were then giving them either a saline as a control or an oxytocin manipulation at the start of the trial. And we could see what happened to their behavior. And lo and behold, we did find a significant effect. Our oxytocin was causing them to spend more time in one body length with each other, which is exactly what we see in the correlations we got from the natural studies. But it also was present in the aggressive behaviors. So if you get oxytocin, you reduce the amount of aggression, even if it's a complete stranger that the individual had never met before. And it also reduced the investigative behaviors. So that was really good study, really good results that all came from adapting a methodology from essentially sort of the neuropsychology sort of field and bringing it into the field, into the literal field. And this is eventually what we sort of came up with. And this all was possible because we put a lot of time and effort into documenting the correlation side of things using the established methods, but also developing these new experimental methods uh, to actually detect the causation. And we could really get this system really nicely worked out, this double feedback loop, and then the consequences of having high oxytocin, hopefully the pup reading, reach, reaching weaning age, and then successfully living through its first year of life, and the consequences of having no high oxytocin and a poor bond being separated and likely dying, unfortunately, for the pup. But yeah, a really successful study that um, we, were, we were really pleased with the outcome. And all the references for all these various figures and things are in the slides. 
um, or you can get in touch with me afterwards and I can, I'm can. i very happy to point you in their direction. So that that is all I'm going to say about the oxytocin uh, side of things. Um, but because now I want to move on to the pollution side of things, because this is a whole different level of adapting lab methodology to this, this field site. Um, so this is more constant. This oxytocin work is concentrating on the cognitive and behavioral side of things. But now we're going to go to the really technical laboratory side of things. And we're going to be talking about the FATS project. So uh, the FATS project was the brainchild of the very brilliant Kimberly Bennett, who I believe is going to be talking to you tomorrow afternoon. So I hope you can all make it uh, to her talk. Here's me and Kimberly and our lovely research assistant, Holly, um, Dr. Holly Armstrong now at the time. She was our, our research assistant. And you can see we're all dressed up in our, in our gear. And I'm pretty sure if I were to ask you, what were we about to do? I'm pretty sure your answer would not be tissue culture. But that is, that is what is about to happen. Um, that is what we are literally about to go out and try and do. So this is the FATS project, which is, as I say, Kimberly's brilliant idea, where essentially she's super interested in blubber physiology. So you can see our seals, all marine mammals essentially, have these massive blubber layers, which are really important to them. They keep them warm, they keep them buoyant, and they act as an energetic reserve for our animals, keeps them nice and healthy. But as I'm sure you're all aware, Persistent organic pollutants are a big problem for these animals because they bioaccumulate up food chains and they're lipophilic. So they tend to get massive concentrations in their blubber tissue. And Kimberly was thinking, well, we really need to get a handle on what it is actually doing to the tissue physiology in these animals. But it's something that had never really been studied before, because how do you get samples from a marine mammal? How do you get them back to the lab to, to put them into tissue culture sort of conditions? It's all very challenging. So there we go. So yeah, as I said, for our marine mammals, adipose tissue is really super important for them. And in marine mammals, it's especially important. But it's true for all wildlife, essentially. Um, now, culture techniques, tissue culture, are a very powerful technique, but it's not used very often when it comes to wildlife research because of practical constraints. Um, you know, we've got a lot of ethical constraints when working with these animals, and rightly so. We've got logistical constraints. You know, we literally can't necessarily get everything into the field that we need to do this work normally. Uh, there's lots of problems with sample sizes and the limited conditions you can actually expose your tissue to. Um, but Kimberly had this great idea. What if we used something called an explant approach to study blubber tissue rather than the more traditional uh, tissue culture techniques that people have been using um, throughout the world? And the explant approach essentially is where you're generating these masses of tissue and essentially putting them into culture keeping them alive for a relatively short period of time for a culture experiment. And then you're collecting the tissues for anal analysis back at the, on the mainland. Now, these techniques are particularly important for studying toxic substances. So here is just a few of the substances that we were interested in with the FATS project. So we've got our PCBs, we've got our PBDs, we've got one of our organochloride pesticides. Ethically, we cannot expose animals to high concentrations of these substances. This is not OK. Um, but we do need experiments to actually document the effects these are having. Otherwise, we can't provide evidence for legislation to restrict or remove these substances. And these obviously have been banned for quite a long time. But there are plenty of new and emerging pollutants that are you know, have plenty of cause for concern. So we need to have techniques that enable us to actually expose tissues from animals to these pollutants so we can understand and document what is going on. So we can prove that these are a problem and we need to do something about it. And tissue culture allows us to do that without any of the negative health effects that would come from exposing a whole individual. So this is all well and good, but how about taking this onto our island, our Isle of May? What are the big problems? Getting samples can be really challenging in the field. They need to be processed rapidly in specialized environments. So if you're stuck out in the middle of some field site, there may not be a laboratory environment anywhere nearby that has running water, electricity, a clean space, and all of these things which are literally basic requirements for a laboratory, they just simply may not exist where you're working. You need to be able to determine tissue viability in the field. Otherwise, how do you know that you're actually keeping your cells alive? You could literally just be incubating and experimenting on something that's completely dead. If you don't have this, you're wasting time and resources and samples. And there is a much higher likelihood of contamination in these environments. 
Um, there's all sorts of reasons for that, and we'll go into it in a few slides' time. So, and yeah, in terms, it, just in case you are not familiar with tissue, the tissue culture approaches, we've got a few slides here on what the viability testing actually involves. Usually involves some type of staining or destructive sampling of the tissue that you're culturing. You have to open it up, take a subsample of the tissue, and you're essentially destroying it to try and figure out how many of these cells are still alive. And it usually involves a lot of specific reagents and then specialist equipment to actually detect the color changes that indicate the cells are still alive. So we've got our trap and blue exclusion test and we've got our, our green fluorescence. Just two examples of the various techniques you can use, but neither of these would be appropriate for use in the field. Just don't have the technology out there to do this. And contamination, yeah, we have to absolutely have to maintain sterile conditions for tissue culture to be successful. Otherwise, you're usually just culturing some sort of nasty bacteria or fungus or God knows what. Um, there's so many opportunities in the field to become, your experiments to become contaminated. So you can have problems during sample collection when you're actually getting the tissue from the animal. You can have problems when you're back in your makeshift lab, actually processing the tissue for culture, or there could be a problem with whatever incubator you've managed to set up in the field that might have something in it that's actually contaminating your experiment at that point. And um, essentially, this is only usually detectable unless you've got some very special equipment in a sort of more traditional laboratory environment. It's only usually possible to figure out this has happened if you see things like this. So this top one is one I made earlier. This yellow color means that I've got some problems with that well. That well has become contaminated. The cell culture media is usually this nice, healthy sort of pinky color. If it goes yellow, it means that there is something nasty in there causing all uh, sort of acidosis of the um, of the buffer, and it's changing color to indicate that something's wrong. Turbidity is also another good indicator. So this is not one that I made earlier, but it does nicely show what I'm, what I'm talking about. So it's just, everything should be nice and clear and pink colored, and if it's yellow or cloudy, then you've got a problem. And that's usually the only indicator you have. It's already too late, something has gone wrong, and now you just basically have to throw things in the bin. So we wanted to develop a tissue culture approach on this island, on, in this environment here. So this is a nice sunny day, but it can be absolutely pelting with rain when we're doing this as well. Um, we need to address all these problems while also actually generating usable data and samples and hopefully ultimately coming up with something that would allow us to, to perform these manipulation experiments that we want to do, where we can actually expose healthy tissue to our pollutants or our hormones that we're interested in and see if there are any changes. So problem one, getting samples and equipment in the same location. The Isle of May has a simple lab with bench space, but no equipment, literally nothing. You have to take everything that you want to be there out there. It does have electricity and running water though, which is a big plus. And essentially what we came up with is we'll take a lot of equipment out there as much as we can, as much as is rugged enough to be transported by boat, which is the only way of getting things out here, and literally putting it on a little trailer and, and carrying it up to the lab. So it had to be able to survive that. And everything we did had to just be reliant on electricity and running water. There was no way we could get the nice uh, air currents flowing through all of our enclosed spaces. That was, that was just never gonna happen. And in terms of actually getting the samples, what we came up with was we would be, so we could, you know, you could easily be working in this part of the colony here, which is nice and muddy, uh, but hopefully you try to stay as clean as possible. You would get your seal, you would get your sample of the tissue from your seal, and then you would put it in a thermos, which has some lovely water that had been pre-warmed to exactly the right temperature to keep the cells nice and happy, and then you would run. And this is a map of the island. So this area here is where we get some of our samples from, but you could easily get samples from over here. And this is our lab here. So this is 800 meters and it's that's in a straight line. So yeah, you have to, you'd have, to, we'd have runners essentially that would try and get these cells back to the lab as fast as possible to keep as many cells alive as possible. Now, this was the gear that we took out. We had our lovely little incubator on the right and our PCR hood on the left, which we had a nice UV light. And that was, that was how we maintained sterile conditions in our lab. You can see it's not really your traditional sort of lab environment, but this is what we had to work with and it did work. We did also manage to get a minus 80 freezer out onto the island. There it is. Uh, just, uh, yeah, so we could we could snap freeze and keep all of our tissue once we were done with it. That is not possible on all sites, but we were able to do it here. 
And there's me with all of the gear, or just part of the gear, actually, that it would require to do this experiment. We had to take out so many reagents, so much lab laboratory sort of disposable equipment. And uh, yeah, but that's me just getting everything out on the dock ready to be shipped out on the boat, which was a rib. So, you know, I don't know if any of you have been on ribs before. They're not exactly the most stable of boat options, but that's what we had because there's particular landing spots on the May, as you saw the coast, you know, there's not a massive lovely port to dock and get everything off, you know, really easily. There is one port location, um, Kirkhaven, but um, yeah, the boats are limited in their size. You only have a few boats that can actually go there. And, and so it's not never going to be this nice big sort of container ship that's taking all this stuff out for you. Okay, so what did we come up with? So while we're on the mainland, we, we ran a pilot study to figure this out. Um, but essentially what you do is you collect your bubble samples, run them back, and this is what they look like when they're fresh. And you mince the tissue, removing any non-blubber tissue. This is what that looks like. So there's some blood vessels there that I've taken out. And then you weigh it into these explants, these blobs of tissue, hopefully hoping that they are still alive at this point. So each one of those blobs is 100 uh, micrograms each. And then we've got our wells of pre-warmed, sterile culture media, ready and waiting. So we can literally just open up that plate, put our explants in and close it up, put it back in the incubator as fast as possible, and hopefully our cells are still alive. So as I said, we did do a pilot on this on the mainland to see if this was even going to work when we can get it back to a traditional laboratory where we did have those laminar flow hoods and all these wonderful facilities. So we were able to get these samples back within two to three, two to four, sorry, hours of sampling, which if any of you have any familiarity with usual tissue culture is a little bit longer than what people would usually do. Usually you would literally get yourselves and go. Uh, but this did work. We did do some hormone and glucose manipulation experiments, and we did find some significant results. So we felt happy enough that we could try it on the Isle of May. So we've solved problem one, but what about problems two and three? Uh, Usually what would happen, so this is our rib, so you can see, again, it, you know, we, we, there is one bigger boat where we can take out the bigger equipment, but you know, this is a very shallow entrance to the harbour, so you have to always keep that in mind when you know, what is actually going to be taking your gear out into the field for you. Um, so in terms of problems two and three, we've got the problem in that usually we would have to wait until the entire field season was over, get our samples back to the lab to test to see if they were alive, see if that viability uh, issue was there or not. And that's obviously not optimal. If we've got something wrong, then we've lost an entire season of, of data. So we didn't want that to happen. Um, and we did have occasional infection problems. And here's another one that I made earlier. Although this was a lot less than we feared. We were very worried about this. We spent a lot of time ethanoling ourselves and UVing everything as much as we could. And only like less than 5% of the expense we generated for the entire project so over three years were infected, which was great. I mean, we, we generated thousands of these. Um, so we were really pleased with that, but it was still happening. And uh, we were concerned that there was there were infections going on that we were missing, that these color changes weren't happening that rapidly and maybe we were missing some things. So what we needed was real-time assessment of tissue viability and infection problems so we could fix things while we're on the island before these problems get out of hand. So what we found after a bit of reading is these oxygen sensors that detect oxygen changes in all sorts of liquids, including cell culture media. Now, this is what they look like, these plain optodes. They can be ethanol sterilized, which is great for us in the field. That's the only uh, sort of, apart from UVing them, which obviously isn't an option because that's not how, that would sort of destroy them. Um, we, all we had to, was ethanol sterilization. So we could do that and they are actually reusable. So that was really useful for us. And what we were hoping to get from these is both the viability and contamination detection, but also potentially being able to collect actual data while we were in the field from our, from our little explant experiments. And that's just the device that reads them. And if you're not familiar with how these guys work, essentially they've got a coating that are quenched by oxygen. So it affects how they're, how they're sort of responding um, to the device. When, um, when you press it to read, then you, it shoots out and it sort of uh, detects the sort of the luminescence intensity. And if it's, and it's reacting, it's being quenched by oxygen, then you get these linear changes, but it's not actually consuming any of the oxygen that's in the tissue um, culture media. 
So that was a real benefit for us. And you can also read it through the transparent walls of your containers. So you wouldn't have to keep opening up our vials. Again, another bonus, because we were worried enough about contamination without opening things up and closing them repeatedly. So this is what they look like in our, in our little laboratory. This is what we came up with after a few different iterations of, of closed sort of chambers that we sort of tried out. So you can see our little uh, optodes are stuck down to the bottom and it's full of tissue culture media ready to have the cells added. And the reason we um, settled on these is that they have been used in the food industry to detect spoilage, to detect contamination and things like that. And they have also been used to detect viability in some um, tissue culture studies actually back in the lab. So we were hopeful that this would work. And it did work. We were very happy to see that there was a massive difference in oxygen use between filled vials with actual explants in them and the control vials that were empty. And if you monitored it over the 24 hours of the experiment, this is what it looked like. So our control vials are staying stable, whereas our vials with explants in them are gradually using up the oxygen over the 24 hours they were incubated. But in some of our vials, something else was going on. So these were not designated as any special type of vial at all. These were normal vials, either with explants or control vials that we set up. But as we were reading the oxygen data from them, so we've got a one hour read, a four, hour, a four or five hour read, and a nine hour read there, and then a 24 hour read, there was a very different pattern emerging in a very small number of vials that we had generated that was very distinctive. And what we interpreted this at the time was that these are vials that contain media that have got some sort of contamination effect in them, even though visually they looked absolutely indistinguishable from all the other vials that we had created. There was still that nice pink color, they were still nice and clear, nothing visually going on there. But you can see the oxygen um, levels in the vials are shooting down essentially to nothing within nine hours. So something is really going on in those vials compared to the ones that are clean and just contain the fat tissue. And this is what the data looks like when you're sort of plotting it another way, looking at the rates. So this black line is our control data, our control vials. So you can see the rate is of oxygen use is essentially zero over the 24 hours. The blue is the nice clean uh, vials with the expands in them. So you can see it sort of stays pretty consistent throughout the 24 hours. But the red are these vials that we suspect are infected. And you can see a relatively high oxygen use rate, and they're just essentially gobbling up all the oxygen. And it come, the rate only comes down because there is no oxygen left for them to use in those vials. So we were really encouraged by this um, because within two or three days of seeing these rapid oxygen consumption sort of data points, the batches of media that generated these vials did change color and they did become cloudy and yellow. So we were getting ahead of our infection problems two to three days before the visual change, which previously had been our, had been our only indicators. So this was a fantastic early warning system. And uh, we actually did the maths and figured out that by you doing this, we prevented a loss of about 300 experiments uh, just in over the course of, of our experiment. So that's a, that's a huge number of experiments, a huge number of irreplaceable tissue samples from our seals and definitely something that we want to avoid if at all possible. So we're really pleased with this as a solution to our problems. And then finally, as if that wasn't enough, we also were able to collect physiologically relevant data in real time from our little explant, uh, uh, experiments in these vials. So this is a figure looking at the tissue differences um, between feeding and fasting states. So we've got feeding when they're with their mother, fasting when they're after they've weaned from their mother, but also looking at tissue differences, tissue close to the body core, the inner tissue, and then tissue close to the, exter the sort of external environment, which is outer tissue, which has long been hypothesized that these really thick blubber layers in marine mammals, they have different functional properties, that the stuff close to the core is more metabolically active, and the stuff closer to the outside is more inert and is more there for thermoregulation. And that's based on structural differences in the actual fat tissue, but this was the first time that we really had actual metabolic data to support that division of function in this tissue. So yeah, we were excited about that. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully I've managed to sort of talk you through and convince you that we were able to establish this protocol for conducting tissue culture 
on a remote field site. And this enabled us to do multiple seasons of experiments to tackle all sorts of different um, questions that we were interested in investigating. And I think Kimberly's going to talk a lot more detail about some of the results that we found, but I'm just going to take you through a few very quickly, a sort of summary of our, some of our greatest hits that have, that have come out from this work. So we can not only sort of look at the metabolic properties of the actual tissue, which has not really been studied before, but we can then look at these correlatory relationships between the POPs that exist in our animals, for lack of a better word, just naturally from what they're ingesting, either from their prey or from, in the case of the pups, what they're ingesting is from their mother's milk in their first three weeks of life. And then look at correlations between what their tissue is doing and the pops they've been exposed to. But then crucially, we can also do those causation experiments. We can also take that tissue and including all the data that we know is, is happening, what, what sort of level they have within their tissue anyway, we can then add on to those doses. We can give them an acute exposure to pollutants. We can raise different hormone levels and see how the tissue responds. So this is just some of the, like I said, it's sort of the greatest hits from some of the papers that we've put out. So this is the correlatory side of things. On the x-axis, we have our dioxin-like PCDs. These are the ones that are generally more nasty and more toxic and cause more health issues for our organisms. And on the y-axis, we've got our glucose uptake rates. And you can see that there's a negative relationship there. And this is in pups, as, like I said, that are, that are three weeks old. So they have never been to sea, they've never eaten a fish, and yet they already have accumulated enough pollutants in their tissue to negatively affect their fat tissue function. So this is an interesting result, but it, unfortunately not a very happy one for us to find. And you can also see different layers of the model here. We've got our inner and outer blubber tissue and our fed and fasting states all having diff slightly different trajectories in the data there. But what about our manipulations? Well, again, there's lots of different levels to this. Essentially, the blue is our pollutant-treated blubber. And then we've got the inner blubber tissue on the left and the outer on the right, because there's only so many lines you can have on a graph before it becomes completely unreadable. So we just split them out into two plots here. But it's the same kind of thing. We've got our lack of better word, natural pop concentrations in our pups on the x-axis and our glucose uptake rates on the y-axis. And we can see how our pop treatments are affecting the tissue dynamics, including the effects of the pollutants they've already accumulated in their tissue. So a really powerful experimental approach that really we really didn't have access to previously. There's been a whole bunch of things people have tried, but marine oil tissue is very tricky to culture. So there's been a few experiments that have been very promising, especially doing things like actually taking the pollutants that are present in, in the blubber samples and actually extracting them. So you're literally getting the natural levels that they would be exposed to and then exposing other tissue. There's all sorts of things that people are trying, but we were very pleased that this works so nicely. And then something that we're hoping is going to come out soon is exposing the tissue to different pollutants, but also different hormones that are to do with regulating tissue activity. So this is a, a result from this paper that Kimberly put out uh, last year, looking at, this is a correlation looking at um, the thyroid hormone levels and how they are negatively related to blubber PCB concentrations. And again, a nice fed and fasting, fed and fasting effect here. And the paper that we're hopefully going to be putting out very soon, probably next year now, um, it's, we're just finishing off writing it, is the hormone experiments and the pollutant experiments. So you've got your control, you've got your hormone exposed, pollutant exposed, and then the hormones and the pollutants. And that explant approach that we've designed enables us to do that. We have enough replicates to be able to do that experimental design, which is great. So yeah, it basically um, also enabled loads of uh, work actually connecting the data from the cellular level to the whole organism level. So again, this is work from Kimberly's paper where we're actually looking at our concentrations of pollutants, how they're impacting the physiology and energetics of our seals across a whole bunch of different things that we're measuring from these experiments. And then interpreting that, knowing what mass gain trajectories these guys had when they were actually on the colony. And what Kimberly found is that, unfortunately, 
while the pop effect, well, fortunately, the pop effects seem to be fairly minimal. But remember, these guys are only three weeks old and the levels that are found in adults are much higher. But unfortunately, what she did find is the pop effects are much more, uh, much bigger in the smallest animals, in those pups that are struggling a bit. So unfortunately for these guys, if they don't reach about 30 kilograms of weaning, they're probably not gonna survive their first year of life. It's very tough for them. You know, They have to go out to sea and forage and find this all out on their own essentially. So the fatter you are when you wean, the more likely it is that you're gonna survive that first year of life. So the guys that are at the lower end of that mass scale, then they're already going to be a bit of a challenge. And our research sort of is pointing towards the fact that the pops are impacting them the most in terms of affecting their tissue physiology. OK, and then there's all sorts of other work that is still yet to be done as well. We have all of those uh, explant tissues in our freezers that people are working on. We're doing things like looking at the actual protein levels in them and looking at signaling all the different hormones and also qPCR to actually look at the sort of the different genes that are being expressed and what's happening. So we're not just looking at the sort of the actual stuff that's being expressed in the, in the cell culture media. Um, we're trying to look at it as many different ways as possible to make the use of all of these samples and all this data. So hopefully I've managed to convince you that we were able to take our, our lab work uh, out into the wild and actually able to control for viability, control for contain, the contamination, sorry, and generate some useful data. And it enabled us to study not only the consequences of the pollutants being exposed uh, to these tissues, but also ultimately to take that to a more whole organism. And then potentially in the future, who knows, we might be able to even think about population level effects. Um, and it had a fairly minimal lab setup, to be honest. You know, this was all equipment that we could put on those boats, ship out and maintain in that environment. Um, the oxygen sensors were really crucial for detecting viability in real time and contamination. And there's massive potential to apply this to other species and other research sites, which we're very excited about. So that is all I'm going to, to say for now. So I would just like to thank uh, the universities that supported this work. So I'm with the University of St. Andrews and the Sea Mammal Research Unit and the Scottish Oceans Institute who all supported this work and continue to support it to this day. The University of Abate is where Kimberley is based and the uh, University of Liège is the, is the wonderful lab over in Belgium where I took all of the blubber samples and uh, actually detected the pollutant levels that were in the tissue. So we got to do lots of mass spec over there, which was really fun. And then, of course, the funding bodies and Scottish Natural Heritage, who have a new name now. Sorry, Scottish Natural Heritage. Uh, I know you've changed it, but I did not change my slide. I forgot. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, they are the guys that actually run the Isle of May and make sure that it's really safe and good for the animals. So they're the ones that we ask to, to go out and study the, the seals on. So if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Or you can email me or you can find me online. Um, but, yeah, thank you very much, guys. <laughs> that's a bad question because i don't really know um yeah so this is a this is something that someone else much much cleverer than me has developed and designed so other than that they react to the oxygen and the luminescence changes in a predictable manner um you do have to control for temperature as well. Um, so we have a temperature probe that goes into the media when we're doing our readings as well. And then we just have to essentially make sure everything is nice and consistent. And the only thing varying is the oxygen. Um, but short of that, I'm afraid I don't know because I'm not an expert on luminescence technology, <laughs> which I know, yes, yeah, I know you're very keen on. So yeah, but um, yeah, they're a fantastic piece of technology. They're tiny, absolutely tiny little sensors. And they're so sensitive. And Kimberly got the idea to use them because uh, she's seen them being used to measure uh, sort of respirometry and things like that in tiny marine invertebrate studies. So looking at the respiratory rates of little copepods and all sorts of little invertebrates that people have been putting into little chambers to, to sort of get a handle on that. So she thought, oh, maybe this would work for our adipose tissue. And it did. It worked, it worked fantastically well. So sorry, I don't have a good answer to that question. <laughs> I was wondering what other species might have just evolved that 
Well, I mean, essentially, as long as you can get the PCR chamber and the, the incubation uh, chamber out to the site, there's not really a limit on what species you could do. Um, there's a lot of interest to use it in whales and dolphins currently. So we're talking to a lot of people trying to take it even more on the road and uh, see what we can do getting cells from those guys. And because this research needs to be done in you know other marine mammals, it's not really enough to say, well, we've done it in seals and this is what's happening in seals. So now we can just apply it to everyone. You know, some knowledge is always better than no knowledge, but actually having knowledge specific to species of concern, things that are known to have really high pollutant levels, things like killer whales and other top marine mammal eating predators, polar bears, things like that. You know, our seals, they are top predators, but they are, our gray seals are for the most part eating fish. I'm going to ignore the ones that have started eating porpoises and, you know, things, things do change and gray seals are now in some areas of, of, of serious predator of harbor porpoises, believe it or not. Um, but for the most part, they eat fish. So they're not quite as high up in terms of the food chain as some of the other marine mammals that we have, which are really getting massive high pollutant levels. And they're probably having much more acute or chronic effects than these guys. So there is a lot of interest for developing it for whales. And essentially, if people want to take it to different species, we're very happy to try. And I mean, we, this is all published. So we're hoping that people will just adapt it and use it just like we have done. You know, we read what our people have done. We adapted it to use it in seals and we ran with it. And we're hoping that's what people will do with the technique moving forward, you know, in whatever species people want to, to work on, essentially. Yes? Which one? <laughs> no. Um, I mean, that we got this out, all samples we got back within half an hour. So there is, there are, some studies done in quite a long time ago on cattle tissue culture that we found where they were doing a similar sort of thing where they were sampling their cows wherever they were i imagine in some sort of field or some sort of shed and running them back to a lab so that was one of the things that we found that we were like okay this might this might be fine having this time delay but i don't know that anyone else has done it since so yeah there's people that have done it before using domestic species and as far as I know, no one else. I'm sure that people do similar things like this, but whether they, um, whether those sort of details are published in the actual paper accounts, I don't know. Um, a lot, yeah, I, it's it's hard to know unless someone contacts you and asks you about it specifically and you help them develop their own method. It's hard to know how many people are doing similar things to you in the field. And then? Hmm, good question. I would like to do it on some of the whales. I think that'd be very interesting because they do have the highest levels. So yeah, it's it's always easier to study things like this in species that have got the higher burdens because you're more likely to find something. If it's a low level, you know, that might be more widespread. If you've got a sort of a very low level chronic exposure, then that might be affecting lots more individuals, but in terms of actually getting an idea of what's the worst case scenario, it's always helpful to develop a technique based on a high pollutant burden and then see if you can apply it. Because if it doesn't work on the high levels, then you know it's probably not it's not going to work on the low level stuff. Whereas if you try and develop something with the low level species, then you don't know if if you if it's not working, it might just be because they've got really low levels and the defect isn't actually detectable. So yeah, it would be really nice to develop this in some of the cetacean species. Um, but yeah, there's there's a lot of, I mean, the, the marine mammals are really attractive to use because they have these high pollutant levels. Um, but yeah, there's there's loads of interesting questions out there. And um, yeah, I think you, you could you could legitimately do it with with anything that has a fat layer and that you, has a is possible to take samples from. So yeah, it would be it would be great to see anyone take this and use it in any sort of other location but for me I would probably and also because I've spoken to people about doing it so I know it's probably possible so it's it's harder to visualize you know oh if someone wants to do this in elephants in Africa so it's hard for me to sort of visualize that because I've got no idea how you would actually do that I'm sure it's possible but whereas I know for the whales it would actually be possible because people have talked to me about how it would be possible so yeah that's that's pretty exciting yeah mm-hmm 
It depends on the size of the boat, I imagine. So yeah, it would entirely depend on, and also the sea conditions, I would imagine. So if you're on a big enough boat, then that would have the equipment installed in it, then it would be possible to do that. We've talked about, you know, yeah, you could have runners in, in vehicles waiting on shore. So you get the samples back to shore and then you get them to the lab as quickly as possible. Um, but yeah, I, I can't imagine that most people would be out in a boat that would be big enough to have it on a boat. I would imagine that you would be collecting, collecting the samples and you would essentially do a few in a row and then get them, get them back. But yeah, no one, like I say, no, as far as I know, no one has done this. So yeah, that's rampant speculation at this point. Maybe a slightly silly question, but logical thing when I have to, like, for example, like, let's imagine I have to collect a uh, tissue sample or blood sample from the seal. I would imagine, like, seal could run away or seals could, I don't know, like, the high animal could bind your sample. And how do we exactly do this? And how do we? So we have a, the laboratory that I work at has a long history of developing the techniques to approach these guys safely, because you're right, uh, gray seals in particular can be, can be, quite aggressive when approached on land. So please don't approach a gray seal, anyone. Um, yeah, so they don't they don't want to have anything to do with humans. So the to study them, the Scottish Oceans Institute has developed techniques over literally decades. Um, and they're all home office licensed, all trained, so they can approach the animals without causing disturbance to the colony. And we do uh, use a short acting uh, sort of drug essentially to knock them down. Not fully because you can't knock these guys down fully because they have they go into a dive response where they hold their breath and then you have a problem. Um, so they're sleepy, but, but they're not responsive enough to actually hurt us or to hurt themselves. So when they're at that level of sort of being of being drugged, then we can take our samples safely. And then they literally wake up in about 10 minutes. That's the window that we get to sample them. And then they can carry on their normal CV lives. So yeah, it's difficult and you need a lot of training. And you have we go in, in with people who are very experienced who've been doing this for a long time, who are licensed to do this. And um yeah, that's how that's how we do it. Um, no, thank you so much again. That's okay.